In this last video for chapter 19, uh, we want to look at what happens if you have a fixed exchange rate, right? So we said in uh, the first two videos, uh, we were looking at floating exchange rates where the exchange rate is determined by the foreign exchange market. Um, but traditionally, a lot of countries have had fixed exchange rates and some still do. And so what happens there, because we know that the exchange rate is related to uh, the ratio of the domestic interest rate to the foreign interest rate. And if you have a fixed exchange rate, then you have no control over your own interest rates because that ratio always has to be the same. And so if the foreign interest rate changes, you have to change the domestic interest rate as well. Now, there is a caveat there, right, which is that if um, that sort of assumes the free mobility of capital, if you don't have free uh, capital mobility so that investors can't move money in and out um, as quickly as they would like to, then you might be able to have a little bit more control over your domestic interest rate relative to the foreign interest rate. Um, but that's an important caveat. And we're going to talk about um, sort of fixed exchange rates and exchange rate regimes more uh, in chapter 20. So First, we're going to talk a little bit uh, of terminology, right? So a peg um, is basically a fixed exchange rate to another currency, usually the dollar, but not always the dollar. Um, and a crawling peg is where you have an exchange rate uh, that moves very slowly, right? Towards an exchange rate target slowly. Um, so one example of sort of uh, a Peg, crawling peg was the European monetary system before the euro. And so the idea here was that we had um, exchange rates within the European Union. So between, you know, the franc and the mark and the drachma um, that were allowed to sort of move within narrow bands, right, around uh, sort of a central parity. And, and the problem, of course, was then that, you know, within that band, you know, there was free capital mobility. And so if interest rates were very different in, you know, Germany or France or Spain, um, then that was going to break that uh, uncovered interest parity condition. Um, and so that meant that countries had to move their interest rates uh, together. Um, and then, of course, by 1999, most of those European countries adopted the euro. Um, which meant that they basically gave up monetary policy for their own national economy, right? The monetary policy is now run by the European Central Bank. Um, and that proved to be somewhat of a challenge for, uh, you know, the countries after the financial crisis, where some countries, you know, really needed sort of loose monetary policy and other countries needed tighter monetary policy. Um, but we had to sort of have a monetary policy that fit everybody, which was not perfect. Um, we'll talk about that also a little bit more in chapter 20. So we have our interest rate parity condition, right? That the one plus the domestic interest rate equals one plus the foreign interest rate times uh, the ratio of the current exchange rate to the expected future exchange rate. Now, if we have a, a fixed exchange rate so that, you know, the exchange rate is always equal to some E bar, then this becomes one. And that means that our, you know, interest parity condition says that the domestic interest rate has to be equal to the foreign interest rate. So when you peg your currency, whether you peg it to the dollar or the euro or the yen, you're basically saying, okay, my interest rate is going to be the same as the interest rate in that country, um, assuming that there is perfect capital mobility. And so there could be reasons to do this, right? Um, but what it means is that you're giving up monetary policy as a policy instrument, right? Monetary policy is uh, usually viewed as one of the most important policy instruments in an economy. Um, it can operate quickly. Um, it can, you know, be pretty effective in changing output, you know, during a recession or expansion. Um, but if you peg your... Uh, your currency to a foreign currency, you basically give up that policy instrument. And, and the reasons to do that might be that you are trying to encourage um, exports, right? So maybe you're trying to keep your currency uh, undervalued so that you can, so that your exports are cheaper for foreign buyers. 
Um, maybe you've had monetary policy problems in the past, you know, something like hyperinflation. And so the only way that you can sort of lend in the uh, international capital markets, excuse me, borrow in the international capital markets um, is with a, a foreign currency peg. Um, so there are reasons to do it, but it is it is important to think about what you're giving up as well. Um, so with German reunification, um, there was a big increase in demand um, for and, and that led to higher interest rates in Germany. Um, and we were in this European monetary system. And so other European members had to increase their interest rates as well. So you can see, you know, German interest rates were over 9%. France's interest rates were over 10%. Uh, Belgium's interest rates um, were over 9%. And these were pretty high interest rates as well. Um, and high interest rates, real high interest rates will lead to lower investment. And of course, uh, will lead to lower GDP. And so what we see is that while German growth was pretty high during reunification, uh, French and Belgian growth was uh, fairly low, right? Especially in sort of this 1991, 1992 um, area. And so this was, this was a problem. Um, maybe it was a sign of things to come with, you know, the Euro uh, where, you know, you basically give up um, the right to control your interest rates um, with one single currency. So finally, we want to think about sort of what happens when you have fixed exchange rates um, and capital mobility. You know, monetary policy in this case doesn't really, you, you're not changing the interest rate, right? And so um, if you have an open market operation, you're going to have a change in, in your bonds and reserves. Um, with no change in your monetary base, and the interest rate is going to, to uh, be the same. Um, basically, what's going to happen is that you're going to give up some of your foreign exchange, right? So when you peg your currency to another currency, the central bank's role is much more uh, to keep the value of that currency at the peg. And so instead of monetary policy affecting domestic interest rates so much, you're trying to uh, impact you know, foreign exchange markets more. Um, if there is imperfect capital mobility, so capital is not perfectly mobile um, in and out of the country, then you can have some power over domestic interest rates, right? Domestic interest rates can be a little bit different than uh, foreign exchange rates. But you know, as long as you're trying to borrow at all on the international capital market, um, you're going to have an issue with a fixed uh, exchange rate. So that sort of how much freedom that you have really depends on, you know, the financial markets and the willingness of those both domestic and foreign investors to shift between domestic assets and foreign assets, right? If your interest rate is lower um, than, say, the a foreign interest rate and you have a fixed exchange rate, you know, there should be capital flow out of your country and into the uh, foreign bond market. Now, so really the question is, well, how much is that going to happen, right? And so if you have strict capital controls, then it won't all go out, but you might not get many investors coming in as well. Um, and the other question is really how much foreign exchange reserves um, the uh, central bank of that country has, because they're going to have to use those foreign exchange reserves in the foreign exchange market um, in order to keep that uh, exchange rate peg. Uh, and if they run out of foreign exchange reserves, then they're not going to be able to hold that peg anymore. 